Um, hi. Ahoy, I should say. Because um, apparently that's my catchphrase. Yeah. You'll see a lot more ahoys through this. There are lots of demos as well. None of them are going to work. So, um, But this is, I say environmentally friendly packaging. I go off a bit of a tangent. And that's okay, I think. Um, well, let's see. And I've also, um, a question for you, I guess, is what I'm talking about best practice or voodoo? Do let me know afterwards. I'll be fascinated to um, to find out. But uh, yeah, I say maybe on the first slide. I, this is very much me hacking around. Um, this isn't production stuff. This is new to me. I've, you know, Netcore is new to a lot of us. Um, so I'm just trying to work out, yeah, what we can do with this stuff. Ahoy. <laughs> the first one. Ah, drinking game. <laughs> uh, so I'm Jason. Uh, I'm a full stack developer. I can break an application at any layer. That's I'm really an expert at that. And I'm an Umbraco developer at Bump Digital, you may have guessed. Uh, I guess Umbraco developer because we only do Umbraco. Um, I would be tempted like Joe to say senior developer, but now I'm the oldest person on the team. That really hits home. So I just, <laughs> I'll just be a regular old developer. Um, and, oh, co-organiser of the brand spanking new um, Bra Wet Wessex Umbraco Meetup. We, I mean, I know what it's called. Um, on the Wessex, I mean, we're all over the place. It is very literally a movable feast on the south coast. Uh, Bournemouth, Southampton and Portsmouth. We've had one meetup so far. But if you're in that area or would like to come to that area, we'd love to see you. Um, just get in touch via Twitter and whatnot. Um, I might be stood in front of important things later, but we'll see how it goes. I will need my notes on here because I will go off and ramble for hours if I don't keep to my notes. So why am I talking about uh, this? Um, oh, I should say, I mean, as you may have guessed from looking at the vent from the vendor talk before, I love talking about performance. That's a th I, anywhere in the stack. I'm a huge fan of talking about performance and geeking out over milliseconds of nothing. Um, and X as well, developer experience, how we can make working with apps working with software easier for people that are developing them. Um, all aboard the V9 Hype Rocket. I love V9. I've been really excited for it for a long time, as I'm sure all of you have. Um, and I guess I'm doing this talk because I installed it. Uh, I started working with it. I found a few, I guess, rough edges around packaging that maybe um, as a community, we might be able to smooth off a bit. Some other options to some issues that I've had, and I'll talk at length about those issues because I think they're worth it. Um, and yeah, why? because I decided to turn on this. Uh, I don't know if you can, can you see, the black is a bit tricky, isn't it? I really should be on light mode. Okay, we've got a thumbs up. Uh, I turned on Razor Compilation on Build and Publish because you should, asterisk if you can. <laughs> um, Razor is a performance nightmare. Um, it really is. Um, it's great at what it's designed to do, but there, there are issues with it, and .NET fixed it by giving us the option. Um, Interestingly enough, so this is the code to turn it on in Umbraco. Um, it's not actually necessary to have this at all because this is the default in .NET now to, to pre-compile Razor. And if you can, I'd say try and use it because it's excellent. Um, <laughs> because Razor needs compiling. Um, there we go. Um, I've spoken to a number of devs before um, who've kind of treated Razor as if it's some kind of magical scripting language. Uh, it's not. If you write Razor, it needs to be compiled before it's going to run. That's what .NET's going to do. Bear that in mind. Compiling is a non-trivial thing, OK? Um, and if you don't do it, <laughs> your web server will eventually. Um, we compile code on our lovely, fast i7, i9, uh, Apple Silicon machines. Um, they do it really quickly. Web servers don't. You know, if we're doing this on an S1 uh, vendor app, as I was, uh, <laughs> you'll see it occasionally there are uh, slowdowns issues. And when you think about it, it makes sense because of what compilation is. We're reading a file from a disk. We're I/O bound. We're lexing it, parsing it, compiling it, turning it into a DLL. Razor files get turned into DLLs that get consumed, popping it into memory, popping it back on a disk. That's quite a few steps. Um, it's not just what our usual web server kind of, you know, read a file, cache it in memory, send it out the next time someone asks for it. Um, obviously, it's, once it's compiled, it's there. But at app start, we're waiting for it. And at scale, um, when we scale, especially in Azure, um, it gets interesting. If you've got users on your app and you think, well, that's too many on my app. I want to send 50 to this app over here. Uh, suddenly, you've got to not only wait for the unbracket to start, you've got to wait for Razor to recompile. and if you've got lots of Razor View, you've componentized your app really nicely, like a like a, a good developer. 
um, then you've got more uh, more things have to compile, more files are going to be read, written. Um, and if you think about your high value paths through your app, if you think about going through a checkout, um, the first person to go through a checkout is going to hit raise a compilation pretty much at every single step. And so your your first user through that flow, yeah, maybe your homepage is uh, cached and compiled really quickly, but the person that's trying to buy something is just at every step through their, their checkout journey just waiting for Razor to do something. So I turn it on, and it's one of the features I've been really, um, really looking forward to uh, in .NET. Um, so yeah, the other one, uh, nullable reference types. <laughs> um, when I first learned about nullable reference types in uh, C Sharp in .NET, I was skeptical because I thought, whoa, this seems like a really different way of working. Um, but I turned it on because why not? And actually, it's really nice. It's really lovely. Why should you enable this? Uh, because the guy that invented null references says they're a mistake. <laughs> um, so there you go. If that's what he says, um, I'm happy to do it. Um, but the key thing is, if you think about it, we, we all forget null checks. That's, that's the issue, isn't it? Like sometimes even the best huge air quotes developer forgets the null check things. And in where I've worked in the past with other softwares before on Braco, there have been like rules. Like Sally Senior Dev has said, do you know what? Um, in this project, there'll never be a null I enumerable. Brilliant. Let that I can work with that. I don't need to null check any I enumerables. Another project, actually in this project, I think that um, why, why would you ever have an empty I enumerable? Like, it's not enumerable, is it? There's nothing in it, so it should be null. <laughs> That's fine again, it's, uh, if, if it's consistent. In Umbraco, we get both. We get some places where an I enumerable might be null, as is the bottom one here. This is a property. and somewhere where it won't be. And what enabling nullable reference types gives us is some hints. This is Visual Studio's IntelliSense telling me, Jason, you've been a silly boy, and uh, you've forgotten to null check images before calling any on it. Um, and actually, I think that's where the, the value uh, mostly is for us as Umbraco developers, because in our views, we can see immediately, do I need to null check this? Actually, no, I don't need to. It can come down on code. Um, and also, if you're, well, <laughs> if you're, uh, creating a library and you turn a, a library that you intend other people to consume through NuGet or whatever. Um, if you're doing that and you turn on all reference types, it makes it really easy for people consuming your app to understand your intent. Uh, if they're calling one of your methods, you can you know you can say this this will accept a, a string or it will accept a nullable string and it makes it really nice for us that are consuming those apps to be able to use it um, and get yeah stuff like this to say well actually that that might be null, that might not be. Um, so if you can, you should, and Microsoft says that. Um, so we have to do what Microsoft says. Um, but no, I mean, both of these things, so raise a pre-compilation to say it's on by default, like I said before, and um, nullable reference types, uh, the, the, the official guidance is use it if you can, wherever you can, because it just makes nullable reference types for a better developer experience, raise a pre-compilation for a much better performance in your app, if you can. Obviously, I appreciate some people have workflows where, do you know what, you need to log into the back office and write some Razor. Pre-compilation is no good. In that scenario, maybe you're doing um, Braco training, because <laughs> that's what we do, isn't it? Log into the back office and write some Razor. That's not going to work, actually, if you turn this on. So just bear that in mind. Um, I think that's it. I'll double check my notes. I might have gone off on a tangent there. Oh, I said about that. That's good. That's good. So, why I'm talking about actually why I'm talking about why I'm talking because I enabled both these things and then it all went wrong for me. Um, or I got uh, just got lots of warnings, which I wasn't very happy about. Um, warnings, dereference of a possibly null reference. So that's what turning on null, null reference types gives you. Your compiler gives you some warnings that Jason, you should null check this. Um, but it wasn't in my code. It was in someone else's. Uh, it was in the views that ship with Umbraco and a package or two. I won't name names. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, views that you know don't null check. Now, that's OK if, if you know, right? You, that's, that's your prerogative as a developer coding your package, whatever. If you know something is not going to be um, never going to be null, it doesn't really matter. But I don't know that if I'm consuming your package or your um, library, whatever. Um, as I say, this is in the views that ship with Umbraco. So it's it's been normal for a very long time for if you're shipping a package that needs views, you ship the views into the package that got dropped into 
the uh, you know the main project, um, my project, <laughs> and it kind of got me thinking um, these questions um, because actually now that I'm pre-compiling Razor, I am compiling someone else's code, and I'm compiling it against things that that I've chosen. Like I've chosen to use nullable reference types. That's my prerogative as a developer in my project. I want to do that. Same with with pre-compilation. But if I'm consuming someone else's code and then building it and it's, it's not compatible, is that okay? I don't know. Um, do packages need to drop views in my project was the next question asked after that. Um, and the answer might be no. Um, we'll see when the demos break or don't work or whatever. Um, and then the bigger question, does the current package convention even make sense in .NET 5? I, and I don't have any answers to these. I really want to throw this out to the community and people that know what they're doing um, to have a think about hopefully the demos we'll have in a second, um, and whether that can, can make a difference and make it a bit easier for developers that are consuming packages um, to make their lives easier. Enter the Razor class library. I don't know if anyone, has anyone ever installed the like default starter projects in Visual Studio? Yeah, I used to love doing that. I used to tell, when I had junior devs, I used to tell them, go do that, learn how that works um, on your own, and you'll find stuff out. Um, I remember ages ago, like years ago, when .NET Core was really new, and I started a, one of those up with identity in it, and I was like, I don't like this login form, it's rubbish. Um, and I wanted to go and change it. Could I find it? Could I find that login form? No. And uh, I l remembered this when looking at unbracketed packages, that that's because the views are in a Razor class library. Um, and I thought at the time, that's a silly thing to do. I don't like that. Now, I realize how useful they are and why it's great, um, or why I think they're great. Oh dear, I should have set my phone to not sleep as well. So, um, yeah, so uh, this is the docs. If you Google Razor class library, you'll get this page. This is the docs. And um, yeah, it's for putting stuff in. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but the way it's kind of headlined is, as you can see, uh, reusable UI is one of the things that you can kind of start thinking about with Razor class libraries. Um, and others we'll get to in a second. But yeah, re re uh, re reusable UI is a really interesting one, especially if, um, so I've worked with a company recently where they have like a big starter project and they've got all this front end code already in the project of all these things I can I could use. 90% um, of it I deleted because <laughs> it wasn't relevant to what I was building. Um, there, because it's handy and there, you know, but, but it's in the project. It's something I have to worry about. It's, it's overhead um, that I don't need if I'm building something from scratch. But think about what we do with DLLs. You know, there's so much code in a lot of the libraries that we import that we never think about, but they're hidden away. That's nice. Um, you can do that with your UI as well. So what is a Razor class library? This is what the docs say. And it just made me chuckle a little bit because Razor views, pages, controllers, page models, Razor components, view components, and data models can be built into a Razor class library. That's like everything, right? I've, it, there's nothing else that exists in .NET that isn't covered by that. So anything. Um, then an RCL may require companion static assets that can be referenced by either the RCL or the consuming app of the RCL. ASP.NET Core allows creating RCLs that include static assets that are available to a consuming app. So everything can go in a Razor class library, like everything that we work with. And I will hopefully demo that now. Uh, what could go wrong? Oh, some, some warnings, health and safety. Um, these are contrived examples. Like I think all the text basically just says ahoy everywhere, so just bear that in mind. Um, and they're examples of what you can do, not necessarily what you should do. Um, I, you know, I've, I said before, I've not used this in production. This is very much just kind of hacking around things that we might be able to do. And what I'd really love, um, the repos will be up at the end. I'd really love some, some thoughts, some input um, to go away and start building things that you find interesting out of these. Because um, I think it could be a way to make all our lives just a little bit easier if, if we're working with, uh, with front end code. Here goes nothing. This is where I've, oh, maybe I can do it with one hand. It's most, I've not got much typing to do, so. Oh, I didn't start this before talking. <laughs> What do you think? Oh. This is where Visual Studio moves everything. I zoomed everything way in. Oh, just out of interest, just so there's there's all those. Oh, oh apparently scrolling isn't an option either. There we go. There's all those um, warnings and things that it doesn't like. Bootstrap three fluid. Um, actually, I, I there is a PR pending. I think I did make one. Um, 
making that a bit better but still it's the concept that um you know whether or not umbraco's code is when it comes into my project is good or not it's kind of out of the question what i'm really interested in should that code be there at all so here is ahoy there we go there is my i told you it was contrived didn't i contrived yeah so uh i'm running a layout page let's let's get rid of that i didn't mean to pin it oh and everything's too long so um basically there's nothing in this page really apart from this partial um it's a partial called page title uh for model.name um but you will notice it does not exist in my project Ooh, spooky um that's because it's up here in this an example rcl i've got a partial called page title and that there it is and i can if everything works out and i write hi and interesting thing about razor class libraries um they are pre-compiled but if you modify them they will reboot your app um, even if your consuming project has already been compiled which is quite interesting um hi there we go oh and i should say so the top bit is um it's saying the page below it i've got on my home page i'm just rendering out so there's a block quote in the grid um which is important for a demo right at the end i just want to prove something um but that's there so yeah and i can override that so if i create a do, 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 do. excuse me yeah. oh that's not html what's the page one Right, I will need to recompile that because that is in my uh, main project, which I've set to. Why is, th why is that there? Mm. There we go. So there's, uh, let me check if I'm actually covering everything I said I, I would. Yeah, cool. So yeah, so I can override that by putting something in the same path. So it follows, uh, for Razor things, it follows the same convention that we're used to with Razor paths, where it does that, it searches in places to get stuff. Um, the Razor class library, when it gets compiled and dropped in my project as a DLL, um, gets munched together with the views I've got locally, and then it's just, yeah, another path that that, um, that Razor can search to find something to, to render what you're asking it to render. So that's what, uh, Oops, what's that? What that's doing? You'll also see I have in here a again lovely and contrived. Uh, I've got my um, a, a CSS file. So let's just double check how I've put that in there. Yeah. So I've referenced this like that. So any static assets you put in WW root automatically get bundled in. They get um, merged with any other Razor class libraries and your projects WWW root, and they get dropped in a directory structure that is forward slash underscore content um so logically www root forward slash underscore content but in your apps root forward slash underscore content an example rcl so in the case of uh, this is my um the name of the library the race class library you can change that i've not got an example of it unfortunately but that there is a um attribute you can put in your cs proj to determine what this should actually be you can change it. Um, you can choose to have it not at underscore content. You can have it at um, forward slash whatever you want, but it's buggy, um, which I discovered yesterday. <laughs> and it works until you pop it in a new get package or try and consume it in another project. And that is a bug, I think, in .NET 5. I couldn't work out from GitHub if it's been fixed or not. So we've got um, all of my demos are using the kind of, I guess, the default uh, structure uh, for that. <laughs> I showed you overrides. Oh, and hierarchy. That's the other thing that's, that's important. So you'll notice this, I've got a shed load of um, Razor class libraries in this project. I've got an example RCL, and I've got one here called Bootstrap 5. And Bootstrap 5 contains a different partial called page title that's very different. And you can see that's being ignored, uh, even if I delete this one that I created. Whoa! I don't turn off my sounds. Mac users, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's rebuild that. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, so you'll notice that, um, well, like the search paths, it's alphabetical, right? So an example RCL is taking precedence over Bootstrap 5 because alphabetically it comes first. If I unreference that project, 
and I, uh, oh, I can never remember how to get there. Do you just turn it off in there? All right. Uh, if I turn that off, and I, I'll recompile. This is where I always shout, use the keyboard shortcuts. But, and then when I'm doing it, so you should get something very different pop out here. Now, when I first tested this, you <laughs> oh, caching. So I've got one of those keyboards uh, that needs you to push the function key uh, the, to use the F. There we go, caching. Love a bit of caching. So you can see that's um, that's now inheriting from that. Um, well it's now using the, the Bootstrap um, Bootstrap Razor class library. Uh, I created a Bootstrap Five Razor class library to kind of highlight one of the other things that you can do with it. So, so this is you know, just a dummy example of how it works. Um, in the case of this uh, Razor class library, I have created a UI library, which is Microsoft what Microsoft suggests you might want to do. Um, if you've got a standard UI that you use across multiple projects, that's something you can do. Uh, Razor class libraries give you the ability to componentize UI, in, which is, we've not really had a nice way of doing that in .NET before. Um, but this lets us do it. And um, why is that? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, and it lets us do it ha however you want. If you want to have one big RCL full of a whole UI, like all of Bootstrap in it, yeah, great. Um, if you want to just have a tiny little one that's just one bit of UI that you want to reuse, then you can do that too. Think like how we use NPM in the front end. If I want to have a, a, a um, React component, I can just you know NPM install some excellent component and it, I can use that in the front end. This gives us a similar ability for, for, for server side, which is really nice. Um, on that note, um, and I've not got a demo of it here, but there is some interop between Razor class libraries and uh, NPM and front end build processes that you can do um, where the two will talk to each other and do nice things. Um, so you could contain your entire front end in, a, in one of these if you wanted to um, and take that all out of your um, Unbracket project. So my example is a, in this case, I've got a view component and these are the default paths um, because I just followed the docs because it makes it easier for me to understand what I was doing at the time. Um, that is too large, isn't it? Whoa, that's too small. Anyway, that's that's a, a carousel component. You don't really care what the code is. It's, it's just there, right? So if I go to my home page and I uh, undo my comments. Oh, it's fun doing this uh, one-handed. Oh, function F5, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this will enable. Oh no! I I no. Oh. That's my fault. It wasn't shift function F five. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna do that. What happens if I do that? Is it still running? Nope. Uh, but there we go. It's an image gallery. You can see it came through. Um. Yeah. 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 Uh, shift F five. There we go. That's why I didn't use the keyboard shortcuts. Let's just build. <laughs> And then run it. Hey. Yeah, I can change the volume. That's that's awesome. Um, okay, I'll, I'll run it with debugging. It's a bit rubbish. <laughs> I don't know why my keyboard shortcut stopped working. Right. So, there we go. Yeah, I showed you the image carousel. So that is using a, oh, it's all gone wrong. That's why I didn't want to run it in debugging because it moves everything around. Right, let's try this again. Shift F5. Go on, someone shout, dot net run. <laughs> Use the drop down. Yeah. How do you run it from a drop down without debugging? Oh, I can just do it from. Can I do it? Jo I never do it without doing a. Um, without debug that one. No? Oh. Hang on then. Well, you'll also notice the new thing in Windows 11 that. Um, did, oh, this. Oh, there we go. I've literally never done that. I've always just been Control F5. There we go. Thanks. Thanks, Warren. Save the day. Yeah. OK, so uh, that is using this view component, which is a regular view component. I'm not going to show you how to make those because I'm not. Um, but what 
you can do with a razor class library that's quite interesting is it will automatically uh, as it gets consumed bundle uh, bundle components into um, tag helpers oh, control. Um, and you can do this VC image ca uh, uh, VC for view component and then image carousel uh, and then it's the image carousel bit of the, the, the name of the class that gets automatically done for you but you do need to include in your view imports a reference to that helper that doesn't work if you drop that just straight into the view imports in your razor class library and on that note view imports you can put those in your razor class library too um, and ha automatically have them available in your consuming project for most things um, what happens under the hood is they get munged together. So you, you end up with one view imports that gets view imports file effectively that gets run, um, but it's a, a agglomeration of, of what you've put into it and, and obviously without duplicates and that kind of thing. And I mean, you can be smart. I've not really um, put much in there, but you can think about if you want to define a suite of interfaces for your UI, you can include that in, in a library and, and do that kind of thing. You can do some smart things with Models Builder as well, um, which I've not done, but you could obviously have your models inherit from your your um, your interfaces for your UI. It can be completely separate. You can have adapters. You can do whatever you want, really. Um, and I quite like that idea. And it, it kind of gives us a bit of, I guess, IOC for our UI. Um, rather than having just a project full of views and partials and stuff, we can actually almost treat an RCL as, as an IOC container. And, and at the end of the day, all you're calling is, hey, just, just get me page title that accepts one of these. Um, obviously, you don't get all the, all the niceties, but that's the kind of thing that you can do. And I think there's scope there for that being really powerful in how, especially if you're a big agency that want to kind of standardize stuff, there's some scope to make that really nice um, for how you yeah how you use it that's that bit done how am I doing for time oh good now this is the fun bit that didn't work yesterday until I discovered the bug in um, weird bug but I won't go into it uh, I want to add a new get package oh it's there look there's one new get package ready to install so there is no font awesome five picker. It's one of those classic cases of, so I started building this package because I wanted to use it and then got stuck down this RCL rabbit hole. So there's literally like no useful code in it at all. Um, but it's good for a demo, so we'll demo. So I'm gonna try going to the back office on this. D and prove that we've got a new package. Don't steal my password. You can tell who has uh, uses a laptop keyboard and who uses a number pad, because sometimes the zero comes first in password zero, one, two, three, four. Sometimes it comes last. So, oh no, settings, one document type. I told you it was a really contrived example. I can, come on. Down the bottom, yay! It worked this time. Uh, oh, yes. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's just default, default. Oh. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh. Woo. Wow. And that's uh, yeah, classic. Well, let's try that again. Sleeping. Hopefully, there's one already exists now. No, there's not. It's there because it was. Oh, no, there we go. FA. There we go, that'll do. There, and it works. I'll save that and go to my. Actually, go to my content page. Oh, it's recompiling. Why is it recompiling now? There we go. It literally does nothing. I told you it would do nothing, so don't get excited. But there you go. What is exciting, though, is that I just installed a new package in this project. Yeah, let's unpin, please. Thank you. Uh, and all that happened, ignoring the changes I've made earlier, the only thing that that package has changed is I get one line in my project. Um, it's done, you know, it's, it's done nothing else to my code, it's not dropped any views in, it's not dropped anything in our plugins. Um, there's just a new package. And I really like that idea. I think 
maybe that's something that we could do a lot more of um, because I think about people consuming my project, all they have to worry about is can it install and that's it and th there's just nothing else to do. So that's nice. Um, and I, yeah, say so I really like it. Let me just show you the code for that. It's again slightly convoluted, uh, convoluted, slightly contrived in this case, but hopefully it makes a lot of sense. I've got two examples of how you can do that. Um, one that is Voodoo and one that's not. So the one that I actually installed was this, and I still have a package.manifest, uh, which is normal. It's the kind of package. Can I zoom? Yeah, y y if you've made packages, you'll recognize this. It looks like how package.manifest look. I've embedded that in an RCL project, so it is an embedded resource. And that this is what makes it a bit voodoo-y, because at startup, um, I read this and, and use it. So I've got a composer. My composer is using this manifest filter, um, manifest filters collection, and appending my own manifest. Oh, this would have been so much easier when I could do shift F12. Ah, There we go. So I've got a manifest filter um, that is reading the manifest. You don't really need to care about that code. It's just code for pulling an embedded resource out and, and, and reading it as a string, um, because that's what I've done. Um, the key thing is it passes that, and then you do have to give it a package name. And I learned today that, that all packages have a name in Umbraco derived from the name of the directory and app plugins that you put your plugin in, which is something new I learned. But you have to give it a name. Then you're package manifest and add it and yeah that's all that runs at startup and then I've got my so in WW root because it's still a um, it's a Raider class library so for my static files everything I need to, don't click on it Jason because it will crash there we go um, everything I need I say is, yeah there's my Spock hand uh, everything I need for that um, property editor in the back office is just in WW root it gets popped into um, underscore content and say so the same that path convention we looked at before and then yeah the back office can just use it and and there's a package that I just installed which is nice the other way of doing it is I have I still need to use a manifest filter much simpler um, this um, where are we? yeah so this creates a new package manifest it gives it a name it includes my scripts still um, but no package manifest in this case, well, no pack JSON file, package manifest, we need to include scripts, but the actual property editor itself, this font awesome five picker, is a, a class that inherits from data editor and has all these um, attributes, and then the uh, it's type scanned and loaded in, it's on the docs of how you can make a property editor from code. Not the hugest fan of, of the syntax of what's going on here, it's... Um, yeah, maybe um, scaffolding out a um, a package manifest just as a C sharp object and just assigning values would have been better and been nicer. Um, I that would have been my third example if I'd have had time. Um, but you can see there's different ways of doing it. Um, whatever works for you, I guess. Um, I quite like the package manifest file because it's familiar, um, but. Times change, it might not be familiar forever. You never know. Uh, oh, and just one, uh, so everything kind of works, and it kind of works as you'd expect, uh, with the exception of internationalization, um, because we have those, um, you know, forward slash lang, forward slash whatever dot XML files in packages to provide translations to the back office. That isn't managed the same way that packages themselves are managed. That's just, you know, th there's, a, there's a class somewhere that just scans through all the lang folders and, and munges them in. Um, and I couldn't find, and someone who's more intimately involved with it might be able to tell me, I couldn't find a nice way to extend that. Um, and of course, the whole point is I don't want to drop files into my package. Um, if I, if no one points me in a direction, I think it's quite straightforward to um, make a PR where you can kind of inject language files, which makes more sense. Um, and of course, there's the new, um, we look at the new back office extension API, or people are looking at the new back office extension API. Um, I'd be quite interested to see that encompass internationalization as well as actually registering your properties because to me that's, you know, if you're registering a package, that's one and the same thing. Internationalization should be a first class citizen um, and part of your package. So if we're going to do it, let's do it in one place. But opinion, so I'm happy to be wrong and for people to do otherwise. That's cool. That's, I think, my package. Um, great. 
And then the last thing that I wanted to show you in my demo site dot web. Oh, that's the font uh, font awesome pick. I shouldn't have called them both demo site dot web, should I? That was silly. All right, demo dot web. Fine. So the other cool thing, um, I'll just I'll. Uh, re oh no! Oh yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, you can tell that I usually use a regular keyboard and don't have to deal with this nonsense. Hence, I've never changed the setting. I'm going to change the name of my view directory to pies. I would delete it. I'm just a bit scared. And uh, the app's going to recompile on me. And it's a different home page. You don't need a views folder at all. Isn't that fun? Um, it breaks things, um, but not as many things as you should think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether that's good or bad, but but it's interesting. Uh, if I d if unless Cam tells to shut up, I can go more into that. Okay, he hasn't told me to shut up. So, um, but yeah. So I I mean you could delete it. Uh, this is now coming from this um, demo.web.ui, where I've just got a yeah the grid, the block list. Um, a view imports, a home page. Obviously, I have, I say obviously, I shouldn't say that. Um, I've spat out my models into somewhere else that I can consume from. So I've got a slightly, um, I depend on how you look at it, it's either a horrible or a, ter a horrible or a great way of handling dependencies. Um, there's no middle ground. It's either one of those things. Um, but that's what I'm doing. And so I can consume those in my Razor class library. Um, it could be interfaces. You could do it different ways. I would have preferred, in fact, I just ran out of time to, to put this together. Um, let's say, I think in compan it, you know, if you're using, um, if you're defining a UI of our interfaces and you're defining, and you're defining your UI in a Razor class library, the two can work really well together. Model Builder will play nicely. Um, and yeah, I've done that. Now, what breaks, which is kind of interesting and possibly worth talking about, is the templates section in the back office. I know there was some chatter uh, on GitHub discussions about maybe if you're pre-compiling Razor, this template section could be turned off, or maybe that's just a nice thing to be able to do anyway, to turn off templates. Um, they ain't going to work. The reason they ain't going to work is because there's nothing in them um, as far as Umbraco knows. So it knows that the template's there, and it still works, and it behaves nicely. Um, but yeah, it's it's empty and it can't actually find the file um, file on disk. I, I haven't tested, but I'm pretty sure if I created a new doc type, I wouldn't be able to assign um, a template to it either. But I think that's really easy to fix um, and could be a quite straightforward uh, pull request to do that. But what I was thinking, given how uh, inheritance, well, how you can override, what you could do is say, well, I'm shipping shipping views in the Mario's a class library, and Braco know where and what those views are, and here gives you the opportunity to override them and create new ones in your local project and, and do something like that. Um, I thought that could be really smart. Um, so if anyone wants to do that, I'll be happy to help work with you on it. It's really interesting. Um, oh, there was something else. What was I going to say? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I oh know that's that. Yeah, so that breaks. Um, as I say, I don't think if I create a new doc type now, let's, let's try it. What's the worst that can happen? Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's create a brand new doc type. And if I want to give it a template, I mean, it does, well, yeah, they're still there. But I I, I did test if you just create a new template and drop it in the Red Class Library, uh, and Braco's not going to see it. Um, I don't think, at least. Uh, not yet, but I'm, I'm sure we can make that work. What I really wanted to demo, and I know it's possible, but I, I ran into time constraints and a snag, was putting a whole starter kit in a Razor class library. Um, it's possible, but I um, wanted to use Models Builder and there wasn't a nice way of adapting, because I'm not going to write a new starter kit. <laughs> there wasn't a nice way, or couldn't think of a nice way immediately of, of handling the Models Builder models, because the way it works, or the way the starter kits I looked at worked, you rely on the fact that you're running your... Um, um, oh, what's it called? Where you import the docs, the documents and stuff, and templates. The um, package migration. Thank you. You run your package migration. That creates the property. It creates your your um, doc types. Then your models are built. So the models that you're coding to exist in the project that that the that you're creating. Of course, if you're using a Razor class library, you're pre-compiling the views. My model, your models don't exist yet. I say there are some things that can be done with interfaces to fix that. Um, 
or A and other. If anyone has any ideas, um, talk to me afterwards because I would really love to be able to do that. Um, again, because you know, imagine just being a uh, .NET ad now, isn't it? Uh, .NET ad package, some starter kit. It drops in your project. It's one line being committed, but then you get all this stuff. You've got your static files. You've got your your views, and then overriding those views is as is as simple as you know, creating one. Um, uh, one CSH file here or there where you need to. Yeah, I think that could be a, a really, um, well, yeah, a really nice way of working with Umbraco if you're using um, those kind of packages. And I think that's it. Um, I was told uh, we're not allowed questions, are we? No, so that's fine. That's fine. So yeah, there are the. Um, that's me on the left. It's not me, um, but yeah, I. Be really interested to talk more about that. I would talk for hours about this. Karen's Freud. I, I, Karen's told people that I'll talk for hours about this if asked. So, uh, yeah, I'll live up to that. Um, I'll do as I'm told. No. <laughs> but yeah, on Twitter, wherever I'm also on Discord, but I forgot to put that up there. Um, reach out. Let's have a chat. I'll be really interested for ideas and things we can build in uh, back office using Razor class libraries, packages, whatever. Front end. Really interesting. And then the if you check my GitHub, that's got the uh, example code that I've gone through this morning. It's not this morning anymore. Gone through this afternoon. And uh, the start of a font awesome five picker that may or may not one day make its way into being a proper package. It's unlikely, if I'm honest. It's, it's there. Um, check it out. <laughs>